I'd like to welcome you to Gettysburg National Military Park and a special part of the park known as Little Round Top. I'm Ranger Chuck Teague. It's my honor to serve here and to be able to interpret the battle. We have through the series of uh, Ranger programs each day a variety of different programs to help you more understand this very complex battle. What we're going to be focusing upon here is just one small sector of the battlefield. The battlefield is almost 25 square miles and this particular sector of the battlefield becomes very, very famous. What is the value of real estate? If you've ever bought or sold property, obviously the cost of that is going to be very much a matter of concern. And I can tell many people who could come up here for the first time, look out over this vista, and I can almost see their eyes widen, imagine a retirement home up here, maybe a vacation home up here, something like that. Wow, if I could have this, by the way, sunsets on Little Round Top do come back. They're gorgeous from up here. This is a great vantage point to see the battlefield. We're going to talk about what the cost of this property would be though because it is enormous and far beyond our capabilities today. When you ever you get any place on the battlefield, get your orientation. Again, we're on an elevation, one of many elevations at Gettysburg. Again, this is commonly known as Little Round Top. Big Round Top is the elevation to the south of us that was fully covered with trees at the time of the battle and uh, was the much highest elevation that you find here. Little Round Top wasn't called Little Round Top. There were ne various names that would be given to this. The one that stuck was Little Round Top. But once you get up here, you realize it's not round at all. It's a ra rocky, craggy ridge which extends uh, northward. But many elevations in the area were at the time considered part of Round Top. Round Top is a large conical hill and uh, Little Round Top, Bushman's Hill, M Munchowers and Old Devil's Den are all part of what the locals used to call Round Top. Looking north, you can see another elevation, not so high as us, but that is Cemetery Hill. Uh, almost directly north of us, you might make out a little water tower which is peeking through the, the woods uh, to the right, an aqua water tower. Cemetery Hill will be the heart of the battlefield. Understand to the west we have a ridge of line, uh, trees in a, in a uh, mountain which is called South Mountain, obviously with multiple elevations, and beyond that is the Great Valley. In Pennsylvania it's known as the Cumberland Valley. It reaches down through into Virginia as the Shenandoah Valley. When troops were first arriving here, from the Union side, they're primarily coming up the road, which extends up. You can see a bus in the distance and uh, several red barns out there in the distance. That is the uh, Emmitsburg Road coming up from Maryland. Maryland, Emmitsburg, about uh, eight miles uh, to the south of us. This was not an important elevation initially. It becomes that as the battle goes through its second day. But initially, not much of anything is concerned with this ground. Uh, again, you've got two roads coming in from the west, the Emmitsburg Road and also what we call Pumping Station Road, in which Union forces would be coming in. There are two roads to the east, the Tawnytown Road just behind this hill, and the Baltimore Pike in which further Union forces would be coming in. And when the Yankees were driven back, and hard to figure out where because it's so far, but see Red, red Barn with the three spikes? Look beyond it and you can see a white steeple. That steeple uh, is at the Lutheran Seminary. That steeple was not there in 1863, nor was that barn, but it gives us a good landmark. It was um, several miles west of that location where the white steeple is, where the first shots were fired. And the Union forces would be pulling back through the course of the, the, the afternoon. In fact, would be hammered back about 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon from points to the west and points to the north, which we cannot see here. The Union forces would be driven back to that cemetery hill and initially formed what they called a horseshoe line. Horseshoe line wrapped around the hill and later on would become a horseshoe with wings. Nobody was up here initially. Again, this elevation was Im immediately not seen as valuable except to the Signal Corps. The Signal Corps was an important role, had an important role in the war because not only they were observation but communication and they would do it at long distances. And there's a boulder actually over there, we won't go by it, but you may want to later, which has a bronze plaque which honors the work of the Signal Corps. Signal Corps would have squads of maybe four or five guys and they would go out and take positions. This is a photograph of the position we're on now, seen from down at the uh, corner of the wheat field. And you can see this was cleared of trees in 1863 prior to the battle. That's going to make it more tactically valuable. 
Again, big round top, full of timber, harder to get around, harder to see. Here you have a much more tactically valuable position here. Signal Corps would get up here, maybe like this gentleman were standing up there, high up, and he might have a flag. In fact, uh, the Signal Corps position would uh, actually communicate with Cemetery Hill with flags. This is a, a grainy photograph, not from Gettysburg, but it does show a, a Signal Corps unit. You can see a man with a flag, you can see a man with a telescope, another man whose head's at the bottom, probably another man who's holding the horses, maybe four guys all together. And with a telescope, he can see far distances. Not only can he see to Cemetery Hill where there's another Signal Corps station, but if you look off to the southwest, perhaps you can make out the hill with the uh, ski slope in it, and the hill to the right of it is Jack's Mountain. When the atmospheric conditions were good, they always weren't, but when they were good, over there you could get a flag bearer waving this red and white flag who could be seen by the guy with the telescope here and vice versa, and they could actually communicate. So from Cemetery Hill to Little Round Top to Jack's Mountain, and then down to Maryland and then to the telegraph lines. Obviously they're communicating, but what are they communicating? Largely they're communicating what they're seeing. And obviously you get up here, and just as today you can see a grand sweep of the battlefield, they then could see a lot of the battlefield. We're talking about four Yankees who are probably the first ones who see any value at all in this ground. We're still on July 1st in the evening, but that evening Robert E. Lee, who's again up near the seminary, that's a good point that we can remind ourselves where he would be observing, he is watching the Union line forming wrapped around the hill. It is a crescent line which becomes a crescent line with wings, one going down the cemetery ridge and the other heading over to Culp's Hill. But the Union forces that are on the left cannot be seen from the seminary. They're on lower ground and actually it's misleading as you look down there today. You can see all those trees down there. Well, this is a photograph which was taken uh, shortly after the battle and see how f fewer the number of trees were back then than there are now, looking actually out in that direction. So it doesn't seem like it's low ground, but you get down there, if you walk it yourself, you'll discover it is low ground. General Meade, when he first arrives, it's two o'clock in the morning, uh, he confers with his commanders, realizes what's happened on the first day, and uh, he takes a reconnaissance himself about four o'clock in the morning, best he can see in the gray of the morning, as it would be called, trying to understand the lay of the land, because ground is crucial to a fighting of the battle. Also where the Confederate forces are, which are wrapping around in a larger arc around the hill, and where he desires his forces to be. His focus is toward the town because the front of his army is at Cemetery Hill facing the front, and in the wee morning hours he looks off to the right and he realizes there's a possible vulnerability that the Confederates might attack over at Culp's Hill. He becomes very worried about that. I want to emphasize that because this is the backwash of the battlefield. This is not important if you're going to be making attacks or receiving attacks over at Culp's Hill. He first of all thinks there's going to be a Confederate attack and then he plans one of his own over there. And again, the only value for this ground here is observation and communication. Tactically, it's not seen as any particular value. He does submit a map and the map has the positions that he wants each of his corps to be in and his Third Army Corps would be stretched out from the Cemetery Ridge down through, well, what would be that low ground there. Indeed, uh, the commander who takes that position, who's uh, famously or infamously uh, here, it's Dan Sickles. Dan Sickles, uh, a political general, really brilliant man, but very egotistical. He doesn't like his position there, and throughout the course of the morning, communications back and forth with Meade about his being stuck in a hole in a morass and not liking where he was. The map that General Meade submits to each of the Corps commanders for positions does suggest artillery be up here, but it has the infantry lined up there and in the lower ground, and indeed has the uh, Third Corps to have uh, forces to its left extending out. Initially there will be cavalry out there, but those cavalry forces under John Buford will disappear. They had been at the Peach Orchard, which is out in this direction beyond those trees. General Sickles is worried because he still has troops coming in in the far distant road, the Emmitsburg Road, coming up. He's got wagons coming up and he wants to know whether that road is to be held and he doesn't get clear understanding about it. There is a lack of communication, effective communication between the Army Commander, General Meade, and General Sickles. 
General Sickles will propose a new line which will extend out to that high ground and particularly when General Buford pulls his forces out and is relieved by Sickles and his division commander Bernie uh, is concerned about holding that high ground. General Hunt will come out from headquarters, look at it and says that's a preferred ground to this one, however you don't have enough men to manage that forward position. I'll report back to General Meade and you'll get further instructions. Those instructions never came. The last instructions that General Sickles received was that he was to connect with the Second Corps, roughly where the Pennsylvania Memorial is, that he was to reach to Round Top and occupy it if possible, but within those general instructions, within those general views, he could position his men as he deemed best. Well, he is going to move some men out to the road and actually have several incremental positions which are not very good throughout the course of the afternoon. At this point, what I want to do is to focus upon what General Lee is intending. Remember the seminary? General Lee's vantage point It was on the evening of July 1st. It will be on the morning of July 2nd, the vantage point. Very early in the morning before sunrise, he will gather key people together, including a, an engineering officer named Samuel Johnston. And he will explain to Johnston that he needs to rec reconnoiter, to take a reconnaissance of the enemy's left. Because remember, Lee cannot see where the enemy's left is. And Lee is very concerned that if he brings an attack, he might be walking into an ambush. You always have to be careful what kind of defense might be found where you go. And so Captain Johnson is ordered to make a reconnaissance of the enemy's left. The enemy's right can be seen, the enemy's center can be seen, but the enemy's left just disappears. And Samuel Johnson will claim, in fact, in a series of letters, that on the morning of July 4th, starting, excuse me, the morning of July 1st, starting at 4 o'clock, July 2nd, let's get our dates right, <laughs> 4 o'clock in the morning, July 2nd, he will start at the Lutheran Seminary and he'll make his way behind that tree line, out in the distance and around. He will claim to have come skirted the uh, lower slope of Culp's Hill and get to, excuse me, of Round Top, get our ground right, that's Round Top, and he will get to this location with his scouts maybe three or four. So you got three or four Union guys primarily over there. You got three or four rebels coming up here. No report of them ever seeing each other. He will get back and report back about seven o'clock in the morning and when he gets back uh, gives a report that Lee finds to be a pleasing one by which Lee plans his action for that day. Gen Captain Johnson will say that the only forces he saw prepared for battle would be some up at the road. What would he see down here? Well, if he's looking there at, say, uh, 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, he might be seeing the Geary's division of the 12th Corps moving out, but he would also see four brigades of the 3rd Corps sleeping in. <laughs> they had come through in the night, and they were sleeping in, not much activity there, and indeed, according to his report, they would not have been prepared for battle. They were bivouacked. He gets back, and Lee uh, is pleased with the report, tells Longstreet at 8 o'clock you better get going and Longstreet is going to be given directions that day to plan an attack which will come in to hit the strike the left of the Union line and indeed the idea is that they'll come down behind those trees in the distance come around and get into a position well where the tower is there swing around and if they can come sweeping over that high ground at the peach orchard sweeping down on those unprepared Union forces they can route them and begin to roll up the Union line. I will tell you things start a lot slower that day though for the Confederates than Robert E. Lee planned. According to various accounts Lee wanted the attack to go in as early as possible in the morning it goes in at four o'clock in the afternoon. Well in the meantime General Sickles is worried beyond the red barns in the distance because he sees evidence of, of movements and maneuvers by rebel forces out there. He's concerned by what is happening and indeed uh, when General Meade calls a council of war at three o'clock in the afternoon requiring all his corps commanders to show up, Sickles sends word that the enemy is forming on his front and that he's too busy. Well, you don't tell your boss you're too busy to come to a meeting he's called and so the boss sends a peremptory order. General Meade says you must come and he will come over, Sickles will come over to headquarters and as he arrives before he even gets in the building, boom, 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 in the distance there's a thunder of guns and Meade runs out, what's going on there and uh, what's happening is the Union forces out at the Peach Orchard, artillery, are firing on the maneuvering of Confederates that are wrapping more and more around. 
Meade will tell Sickles, get out there as soon as possible. He will ride out himself. And by the way, we can't sit on this rock. Parenthetically, thank you. Uh, and he will ride out there, and as he, go, he goes out, he will be sending Governor K. Warren, his aide, actually he's the chief of engineers for the commanding general of the Army of the Potomac. He will send him up to this ground to see what is going on, what is going on, expecting he would have a vantage point here, as indeed you have today. Well, General Warren gets up here and orders guns, perhaps guns down on the Devil's Den, to fire out into the distance of those woods. And he will detect exactly what Sickles was worried about. And I want to quote what he says because uh, Warren puts it in a dramatic fashion. As the shot went whistling through the air, the sound of it reached the enemy's troops and caused everyone to look in the direction of it. This motion revealed to me the glistening of gun barrels and bayonets of the enemy's line of battle, already formed and far outflanking the position of any of our troops, so that the line of his advance from his right to Little Round Top was unopposed. And I have been most particular in telling this because this discovery was intensely thrilling to my feelings and almost appalling. They had not realized that the rebels were wrapping around. This was the charge that Longstreet was to be made. Although in the meantime, they had adjusted their plan to pull General Hood down farther there. Well, he realizes the rebels have a pretty clear shot coming over here. And who is left to defend this ground? We have these maybe four signalmen. Hood has got about 8,000 men <laughs> ready to attack. There's a speed bump at Devil's Den and about 1,300 Yankees that are on a ridge there, Houck's Ridge, as the rebels would be coming in. But obviously Governor K. Warren is quite concerned, quite concerned about what is about to develop. He has no command of troops himself. He simply has a couple or three aides with him. And he sends the aide out with an, aides out with an all points bulletin. We need help, we need help. And as the aides go out looking for help, he himself will also go out seeking for help. By the way, as he goes, he sees the Signal Corps packing up their telescopes and rolling up their flag and getting ready, because they can see that too, and they know what's about happening. And Warren will tell them, no, you stay here and make this hill look occupied. <laughs> Whatever. So four men versus 8,000, I'm not sure that they could r really deter that attack. But what we have here is a r uh, as a race and the finish line will be round top, a little round top. And what we'll do is see rebels coming in, we know those, but what Union forces can be coming here? And again, Warren is not a commander, he cannot command anyone to come here. And his staff officers, his aides who go out, are also not commanders, they can't command anyone to come here, but hopefully they will find someone. In fact, two brigades will be called up, rushed up, one of which is down at the corner of the wheat field there, and we're going to be talking about the story of that brigade under a guy from Erie, Pennsylvania by the name of Strong Vincent. But we're going to leave this busy spot and meander down the ridge line here to get an idea of the race and the rebels as they're headed this way, as the Yankees might be getting here, and see who gets to this bastion, what, what actually Longstreet will call a Gibraltar, that big rock which guards the entrance to the Mediterranean. Well, this would be visioned as an, a Gibraltar. If you get forces here, can they possibly be taken down? Let's move on. All right. As we pass this, I want to point out these guns. I'm going to be talking about these guns here. Charles Hazlett's battery here. We're going to be heading down to a position where we can see the Confederate attack, but I will be referring back to these guns. All right, uh, again, looking off in the distance, you can see dark trees beyond the grassy area. That's where the uh, attack would be beginning. Initially, there would be cannon fire back and forth, and about 4 o'clock, under the direction of General Longstreet, and under him, General Hood, they would be attacking. Longstreet is an operational command of the attack, which is going to be coming in. And again, he takes his time on July 2nd to form his troops for the attack, 
an attack which was supposed to go in as early in the morning as possible ends up starting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and that loss of time is going to be a factor. But under him will be two division commanders who are present. He has a third picket who's not up, but he'll have Lafayette McClaws and he'll have Hood. Lafayette McClaws, by the way, uh, was leading the column and he was told that when he got into position there he would have basically no one on his front. He peeks through the trees there looking at the peach orchard and says, I got the whole Union Army on my front, which is a bit of an exaggeration. But the point is they had to make the change which was shifting troops under John Bell Hood farther south. John Bell Hood is a guy native of Kentucky, but he claimed Texas when Kentucky did not secede. This guy was very debonair with the women, but he was also fierce on a battlefield. In fact, one guy said you could always see the fire of battle in his eyes. <laughs> this guy really was one of the great warriors of this great American Civil War. He initially didn't like his orders because the orders from General Lee were to attack up the Emmitsburg Road, and he's looking from his position over there where the trees are, and he sees this big rocky hill here. And he can probably see the guys waving their flags. He can also see guns on the hill in front of us. That's Halks Ridge. And there is a bit of an optical illusion. From his position, he could not tell that there was a valley here. We call it the Plum Run Valley between Halks Ridge and what we can now call Little Round Top. And from his position, they sort of merged or blurred together. So it looked like he had just one big rocky hill, and he did not want to pass his men in front of that hill, subjected to any fire coming from that hill, or even, as he said, this taking rocks and throwing them down on us. And so he brings about what he calls a digression. A digression is when you, you're going to get done what you're told to do. Your wife has told you, come right home after work, but come by the 7-Eleven, get milk and cheese and eggs. And so after work, you start to do that, but some friends say, hey, let's go out and get a brew. So stop by the pub. That's a digression before you get to the 7-Eleven, before you get home. When you finally get home, you have done what you're told to do, except for that digression. Well, Hill's digression was to take this hill. And so he will be sending men in this direction rather than sending them up. And indeed, when the attack is underway, as his men are storming across those fields there, he will actually be hit himself by explosive shell hit in the shoulder, knocks him out of the saddle, actually paralyzes his arm for the rest of his life. And indeed, since there's no vice commander at any level or deputy commander, you've got to reach down and get the senior subordinate commander, bring him up, and there's going to be a disruption in command and control of this attack, which is going to be going on in the late afternoon of July 2nd. His men are coming this way, and uh, I have to be careful here. Any of you from Texas? <laughs> Well, my mother, my wife, my son is now from Texas, and they all sort of have mocked me for trying to pretend like I'm a Texan because I'm Pennsylvania born, but I'm the odd man out in the family. Uh, I want to quote a Texan here, and I want to put the spirit of that Texan in because they really have a way of talking about what's going on. So he's among these guys coming across there, and he just says, In one wild and frantic and desperate run, we're yelling and screaming and shouting and over ditches up and down hills, boasting through garden fences and shrubbery and occasionally dodging the head as a bullet whisked by the ear. And on we go with the same speed. We're jumping over, we're plunging through creeks, we're pulling through the mud, we're struggling through the underbrush and still keeping up that loud, irregular, confederate yell. By the way, high pitched and wavering, are you ready to demonstrate it? Ready? <laughs> Oh, that's not scary at all. You're not going to scare any Yanks. We're going to try this one more time. I want a real, real rebel yell from you. Ready? <laughs> anyway, the Yankees, they got chills up their spine when they would hear that as they're coming across there. And then, well, who's going to stop them? They have, a, again, a speed bump up there, and uh, uh, Hobart Ward's brigade is going to do what they can, those four guns on the top there, but the rebels are going to be storming up over that. But in the meantime, what about the Yankees? Well, I talked about Strong Vincent, who's going to be bringing forces in. He is a, from a graduate of Harvard University, not a professional soldier, but he will be bringing, swinging his men around from the rear, swinging them around here and getting into position by which he can bring about a, uh, a blockage to that attack. He does not bring his men to the high point of the ground. This is the topographical crest where we are. We're going to try to get a position where we can understand where he would be. Because if you look here through the saddle, notice how our modern day road avenue disappears. When you're on the top of a hill, you cannot see the very bottom of it. It's hidden. 
So what he needs to do is to find the military crest and there will deploy his men. And very heroically and with great drama, he will set his men from Michigan, from New York, from New York, and from um, Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, and Maine in a position by which he can try to defend this hill and the left flank of the entire Union Army. Let's head on. Chuck, have you ever done any reading where each regiment or division had a little bit different on that rebel yell? They do. Always and, a little and bit different. We, we, uh, that's correct. In fact, there were some competitions uh, between units as to how they would do it to try to be one up on another unit. We, the only sound recordings we have, we have one from a, an old codger uh, many years up in age, and he's trying to give it. But they all agree it's sort of high pitched and wavering. Yeah, sort of like an Indian yell. Yeah. Okay, we have come down off the topographical crest somewhat, but I want you to look down to the monument directly behind me, to the 16th Michigan. That is going to be the unit that, that Strong Vincent will put on his right, and then to his left, its left will be the New Yorkers, although their monument is at the top, and then the Pennsylvanians, and eventually we'll get to those guys from, from uh, Maine. As they're coming up here, he is getting his men down to a position where they can see the base. The military crest is valuable for several reasons. As I mentioned, you can see the base of the hill. That does not allow time for the enemy to reform and to prepare for an attack. It also allows you, if you're driven back, to still have defendable ground. If you're up here and are driven back, you're off the hill altogether. Down there, you have room to come back. But more importantly, you're allowing room for reinforcements to come in. So very tactically wise was the decision made by Strong Vincent to move his men down to the uh, military crest. And coming through this uh, saddle, if you will, uh, from uh, Big Round Top to what we call Little Round Top would be the Rebels. They would also be coming over Devil's Den. Strong Vincent disobeys orders to come here. He had been ordered to stage his men at the wheat field under General Barnes, preparing to go up to the Peach Orchard to help defend the position there held by the Third Corps. He disobeys orders, but this is an example of how disobeying orders can be the right thing. If he had not disobeyed those orders, in fact, when he was trying to get directions from General Barnes, nobody knew where General Barnes was at the moment. General Barnes was the only one who could give him orders. I can tell you that the aide to the staff officer from headquarters does not have authority to tell him to come here. But Strong Vincent decides it must be done, and it will be done, and it is done by Strong Vincent. So he sets his men up here, and then we have a series of attacks that are going to be make, made on this hill. The guns up there will be following, uh, by the way, uh, it's Charles Hazlitt's battery. For years I said Hazlitt until in a group such as this several years ago, a lady afterwards came up to me and said, why do you say Hazlitt? And I said, well, that's his name. She said, well, he's in our family and, and we, we're Hazlitt's. <laughs> and then I realized my fifth grade teacher was a Hazlitt. Well, I'm from the, out, out western Pennsylvania, they were from Ohio, so it's Hazlett. But anyway, Charles Hazlett will be bringing guns up there. In the meantime, also, Governor K. Warren will be finding other troops to come up here. And uh, again, Longstreet watching in the distance is seeing how this hill is being made into a Gibraltar by these Union forces that are coming in, both infantry and artillery. Although when General Warren gets back and sees the guns up there, he will tell Charles Hazlett this is not a place for effective artillery fire. For distance firing, it might be some fine, although you have to have smooth ground. You're going to see much smooth ground up here. There's a recoil of about nine feet for those guns when they fire. And also, you can't fire down the hill. You can't depress your gun to fire down the hill. So it's fine maybe for long distance, but to stop them wouldn't make a difference. However, one of those guys down there in the Union infantry said, uh, that no military music sounded ever sweeter than the sound of those guns. You hear that pound, pound, pound coming in from behind you. Gave those guys uh, a sense of strength down there. So we have uh, the fence as the rebels are coming up. And uh, it is, well, the Texan says, Shells and grape shot, canister and mini balls, they all came curtling through our ranks, bursting, screaming, whistling. But still we had that same wildness and unhesitating rush toward the enemy. A guy from the 16th Michigan, their monument down there, will say, say it seemed like guys on both sides, every man on both sides was actuated by the most intense hate and determined to kill as many of the enemy as possible. And by the way, 
it was so noisy, commands could not well be heard. And so as the attackers are coming up, the fire of infantry, the fire of artillery, things are getting tighter and Strong Vincent is doing his best. At one point the 16th Michigan will falter and they'll be falling back at some point. We don't know exactly what happens because the accounts are so chaotic trying to figure out, but we do know that there's a boulder up at the top which says Strong Vincent fell here. That's when he was trying to bolster the 16th Michigan. We also know a marker was put back over there where he fell and if it's over there and that was for the 16th Michigan we know that it was pretty dire circumstances. We don't know exactly what happened but many men are being are down. In fact uh, fortunately uh, we have Charles Hazlett, give him credit, uh, who's back there and another Union brigade is coming in. This brigade is coming in under uh, the command of of Stephen Weed and his first regiment uh, will be uh, with the 140th uh, New York and that's going to be uh, Patrick O'Rourke. Patty O'Rourke by the way his monuments up there this is the bas relief with the shiny nose please do not shine his nose anymore. <laughs> for some reason people have the idea you do it for good luck it doesn't work and in fact uh, it harms the monument but also when he brings his men over the crest of the hill down this way boys He's knocked down. And apparently so close was the soldier from the rebel forces who struck him down that others who were with this man, Patty O'Rourke, could tell who it was. And after the action, supposedly went down and found the body of that dead rebel who had killed their commander with 16 mini ball holes in him. So again, this is very close. The 140th New York comes up and rallies at the top here and uh, meanwhile the Confederates are trying to make successive attacks. But understand linear formations which are used in attacks in the Civil War are very difficult here. For the, for the Yankees, they had taken advantage of the ground by piling up rocks. And this photograph from after the battle shows how they piled up rocks. You can see some displayed down there as they would today. You can understand where the rocks might come from. Not farmers' walls, but primitive breastworks, if you will, that would be built up. The rebels coming up, of course, they have many boulders to hide behind, but they're not going to be able to advance if they stay hiding behind that. And indeed, uh, a Texan again, my apologies, but boy, they're great in the way they express it. Every tree, every rock and stump that gave us any protection from the rain of miniballs that were poured down from upon us at the crest above was soon appropriated. And John Griffith and myself preempted a moss-covered old boulder about the size of a 500-pound cotton bale. Well, you can pick which boulder you want it to be. I, I don't know which one it was, but he says, Every fellow was his own general with private soldiers giving commands as loud as officers and nobody paying much attention to anybody else. It is absolutely chaotic here as the troops are trying to storm up here. Again, sometimes looking like they get the advantage, but then the, the Yankees are holding their position. On and on it goes. In fact, it was a huge maelstrom of fire here, uh, artillery fire as well. In fact, this area down here was described by one as a smoking crater, a smoking crater. The man from the 44th New York, again his position was down there, said the air was saturated with the sulfurous fumes of battle and was ringing with the shouts and groans of the combatants. Well, again, an extraordinary moment here. Who could hold, who could take this ground? It was cl not clear for 30 minutes to an hour as the rebels continued to surge back and then, then driven down, surge up, being driven back. Very, very chaotic. But largely through the heroism of uh, Strong Vincent and Patty O'Rourke, both who died. Well, Stephen Weed, by the way, he comes up bringing forces. He will get hit and he's down. By the way, his last words, very curious. In the 19th century, they put a lot of stock in the last words. His last words reportedly were, I'm as dead as Julius Caesar. <laughs> but then Charles Hazlett, leaning over, remember the commander there, he is struck down and killed. I can't begin to account every death that's happening here, but I give you an idea of all these who are already casualties, and casualties on both sides as it's coming up. Right now we're talking about 5.30, 6 o'clock. We're co coming into dusk in the evening, and very much uh, smoke covered as, as it becomes just fearful. And again, a lot of fire. At this point, we're not so much into volleys because it's, it's free fire. As it's, it's quickly as you can load, you will fire. And the rebels are trying to storm up as best as possible. 
Well, I will tell you that with the support that Stephen Weed's men bring to the Brigade of Strong Vincent, this will be able to be held, although there are going to be more attacks and defenses. And indeed, we don't have time to express them all, but you're going to have a case where the, uh, the rebels are going to be storming through the wheat field, storming up here. They're going to be met by uh, the, the, the U.S. regulars who then have to withdraw back and then uh, the Pennsylvania Reserves will attack back and forth. So this whole front of this area is just going to be continually involved with fire. And indeed, bloody, this uh, creek down here known as Plum Run will become known as Bloody Run. This little area down here will become known as the Slaughter Pen. So terrible, terrible was the fighting along there. But the fighting is not over. Most famously, due to the movie Gettysburg and the novel Killer Angels, there's a part of the little round top story which involves the 20th Maine. And we cannot interpret it without doing that because you'd insist it. So have you seen the movie or read the book? Okay, I see a lot of hands. If you haven't, it's worth it. Although, as I was mentioning to the gentleman coming up, uh, to make a movie cohesive, you can only take about four or five storylines. And just like Robert E. Lee is a storyline, and John Buford is a storyline, so is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain a storyline. What he does here is an, an incredible. Although, what Stephen Weed does here, what Strong Vincent does here, what Charles Hazlett does, there are a lot of incredible things being done here at, at the, this real estate known as Little Round Top. We're going to try to get back. It's a little bit of walking difficulty, so I want you to be very careful as you do so. And we're going to get back across the avenue, Sykes Avenue, and getting over to the southern slope. Remember I said that this western slope was cleared of trees, but over where the 20th Maine will be fighting uh, will not be. Just, just before you Questions? Yeah, just really quickly. Yes. yes. Aren't a number of people being shot? from Devil's Den down there, did, how, did they, yes, get, how that, did they get that? They, they will. The Confederates will take that position on the evening of July 2nd, okay. and they will use it as sharpshooters' nests, and throughout the course of the day on July 3rd, they will be firing, coming from back and forth. They're particularly trying to fire at officers and, and, and artillerymen, and with marksman rifles that had a, had a range of six, 700 yards, maybe even more. We actually have in our museum an incredible piece that was recovered after the battle, which was carried apparently by a Texan there. The, the, the rifle weighs 40 pounds and it, it has the capacity perhaps 800 yards to firing. Did they take that from Sickles? Did he have that? Thing? Sickles did have. Hobart Ward, yes. Okay. The, the, uh, Hobart Ward is the brigade commander under David Bell Burney, the division commander under Sickles, the corps commander. So the Union did. That's the 1,300 men I was talking about earlier okay. right. who would be down there and the four guns of Smith's battery plus two guns that were down in the valley. Okay, did any of those men survive to come up here? Or yes, they retreated, yes. Oh, so many were slain, but yes, many many did come up. Come up. Uh, famously, we do a program on Devil's Den. I don't want to get too much into That's that, but, yeah. but, there, but there was terrible slaughter there as they were trying to hold, especially the orange blossoms. There actually have photographs that were taken like a couple of days after the battles. That there were, in fact, uh, they would have the dead laid out, uh, not only in Rose Woods, but also down down there. Uh, it was it was well, grievous, very grievous. Chuck, one quick thing. Yes. Uh, it, it's a, uh, you, and you don't have to get into the response, but it seems like this gets the attention. And as you know, a lot of things happened over that time period at Culp's Hill. Yes. It seems like the the ordinary person, myself included, we forget about that what was happening there. Although this is important too. It is. There, there are two flanks of an army, uh, one the right and one the left. Harry Fonz, who used to be the senior historian here, retired a number of years ago, but in several conversations I had with Harry after he retired, he would ask me, are people, are people inquiring about Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain? And I said, of course they do, every day they ask about it. He said, well, when I was here, this would have been back in the 60s, 70s, people didn't ask about him. But then he says, well, they're asking about Colonel David Ireland. And I said, well, not really. <laughs> Colonel Ireland is doing an amazing work on the far flank as, as was being done by Chamberlain here. So we don't want to in any way disrespect yeah. one as we honor yeah. another, but there's a lot of things going on. And in fact, the heaviest day of fighting will be July 2nd. And there will be a battle of battles because of the initial attacks coming in. We have Foote's division, we have McClaw's division, we have Anderson's division, we have Johnson's division. It's supposed to be Pender's division. A lot of things were supposed to be happening. Uh, much of it did, and July 2nd was the heaviest day of casualties in this entire battle.
you know, when John Stu got here, if he went a little further, and we, you don't know whether he did or not, he would, Lee wouldn't have had some uh, very good uh, response from him. You know, around to see, uh, there's Meads, uh, you know, the train, the six cores over there. Well, the six corps is not getting up yet. The six corps is arriving maybe two o'clock in the afternoon. Johnson is doing his his uh, reconnaissance six o'clock in the morning. Okay, yeah. So they wouldn't have been right, up. Yeah. But we we speculate is what Johnson saw. Many deny that Johnson got to this point. It's very possible Johnson got here and could have seen Sickles' men without having been seen by the Signal Corps men who were up on the other slope of the hill. All right, let's follow me carefully, please. Step over this way, make sure the cars and buses can get by you. <coughs> Just one quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're right on the sixth court later in the day. But when uh, John finally got up there, uh, were they held in reserve for the rest of the day? Or did they... Did, did... It's a long story. First of all, the advance of the, uh, of the sixth court arrived at two o'clock. Mm -hmm. The rest, some didn't get here till eight o'clock that evening. They were uh, to be, become the reserve, as the fifth court had been the reserve, which would be moved over here primarily. And that's another issue because uh, when the 6th Corps came up, Meade had directed that the 5th Corps would move to the left. That would be 2 o'clock. The 5th Corps didn't get over here until 5 o'clock. So there, were, there was a delay and George Sykes, commander, sometimes called Tardy George, I think that he was slow in getting his men here too. This is the brigade marker for Strong Vinson. James, James Rice will take over for him when he's down. You can see the four units here. Anytime you have this bronze tablet with the inclined plane on, on uh, granite base, this will be for a brigade either side. And they're very, very helpful. Have the itinerary and also at the bottom will have casualties. And there will be many casualties in this action here. What we're going to carefully do is to cross a road which wasn't here in 1863 to a carriage trail which wasn't here in 1863. We've come over to the wooded side of the hill but again, there wasn't the uh, convenience of maneuver that you have that was available to them. Also, as you look into the woods, you're not seeing today what you would have seen in 1863. Uh, because cattle roam freely and because farmers, whenever they needed wood, would just chop off lower branches of trees, uh, it, it had more of an appearance of a picnic grove. So the thickness that you see today is not like it would have been in 1863. We're going to one portion of the field where we have tried to maintain that Im image, but it's not so ecologically sound because if you have no new saplings come up, obviously in a generation you have nothing left. Uh, but that was what was happening in 1863. The carriage trail here was put in so visitors with horses and carriages could meander around. And of course later the avenue was put in for those with cars. These were not here at the time, but we will be going down to the position which would be held on the far left. 83rd Pennsylvania and then the 20th Maine. The 83rd Pennsylvania was Strong Vincent's own brigade, uh, own regiment in the brigade. He had been promoted up to brigade command but had not yet received his promotion to general. A brigade commander is supposed to be a brigadier general. It has so recently happened that he was still a colonel when he was fighting here. Although I will tell you that he fought so well he would be posthumously promoted to general and would be recognized as that. But he was a colonel when he was here. Also to give you an idea, uh, this, this is a, a photograph of uh, Alex Rogers, a color sergeant of the of the 83rd Pennsylvania. Look at the flag after this battle. When I talk about the air being strewn with iron and lead, it's hard to imagine until you see pieces like this and see the shreds of this flag which was held on Little Round Top. It is an enormous fight here. Well, enormous, not that many people compared to the 160,000 who would be fighting in the whole battlefield in the three days. We're only talking about several brigades and we're only talking about a couple hours but for those men, it was very, very intense.
Watch your step here on the rugged ground. Again, notice the appearance of more of a picnic grove here where you can walk easily underneath it. Again, that's how much of the uh, wooded area would have been in 1863, but is not so ecologically sound anymore. What we find here is a right flank marker uh, for the 20th Main. It's along a, well, it's along a fence, a wood, uh, stone fence that was not put here before the battle. In fact, didn't occur till the third day of battle. Uh, in fact, there's an iron tablet down there that will explain that. There's another stone fence that you see down farther there. Chamberlain will say that when he put into game into position that they, just like uh, had been done by the other regiments in the brigade, created some breastworks as best they could along here. Uh, we don't know accurately whether this is actually the flank marker. Uh, we know it's a flank marker, but the problem is the flank marker of the 83rd over there is about uh, 50 yards beyond here. They would not typically have had that gap. Uh, you don't want that gap appearing between regiments because gaps can be uh, exploited by the enemy. So I think with the road going in here that uh, the marking of the positions has been a little bit obscured. Point being though, uh, Strong Vincent, who again was the brigade commander and puts the units in position, comes to Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. By the way, he bears a very striking resemblance to a younger Jeff Daniels, the <laughs> movie actor from uh, uh, the movie Gettysburg. And Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, a fascinating man, a uh, brilliant man, professor at Bowdoin College, who was a strong unionist and also a strong abolitionist, believing very strongly in the cause of this war to stop the rebellion and to hold the union together and to free the slaves, had been encouraging his students to uh, join up and then with a crisis of conscience realized he had to do it too. Very poignantly shown in the movie with his wife Fanny as he says, I've got to go off, I've got to do this. He uh, had no training in the military whatsoever. He was a professor of rhetoric, philosophy, religion. He was not a, uh, a man who had studied military at all. Uh, but because he was an officer, so he's so well respected, uh, he immediately was uh, uh, put into a, a field com uh, officer command, uh, major, lieutenant colonel. And then when uh, Adelbert Ames, the colonel of the 20th Maine, was promoted up to brigade command in the 11th Corps, it was just sort of a natural thing that he would become the uh, commander of the 20th Maine. Uh, every night before you go to bed, I think he was reading his Bible. He was a devout Christian, but he's also reading the manual. What do I do tomorrow? <laughs> How do I put out the orders? How do I explain things? He will have two brothers here. By the way, the movie only shows one. He will have a brother who's with the United States Christian Commission, also serving at Gettysburg. But he's put down here on the far left flank, and he's told to hold it at all hazards. That is one thing you did not want to hear. To hold it at all hazards, at all costs, means basically to the last drop of blood, you have no justification whatsoever of leaving this position. Of course, Strong Vincent explained, you're not only the left of our brigade, but you're the left of the army, and if the enemy come in around you and they get into our rear, obviously it could be disaster. So he has this position which just reaches down here, and you can see a monument down there, a gentleman with a, an orange shirt and a monument. People ask me where, why his statue isn't there, and that's not my decision. I didn't decide that it shouldn't be there. That was decided long ago. In fact, the direction of the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association is that you could have generic soldiers on your monuments, but otherwise they had to be high-ranking generals. And uh, you just couldn't put up a statue to your Uncle Billy Bob who's just, you know, you want to <laughs> honor him. Um, by the way, when the 80, 83rd Pennsylvania Monument went in, some question about it because it looked, sure looked like Strong Vincent on the top of that monument. And uh, Strong Vincent at the time was a colonel and wouldn't have been worthy of a monument as of an individual. Apparently when it was unveiled uh, and the commissioners said that sure looks like a, bears a striking resemblance to Strong Vincent. The, uh, the veteran said, you know, now that you mentioned, there is a strong resemblance. <laughs> In fact, there's no question it's, it's Strong Vincent. He got the monument as a colonel, of course, belatedly, posthumously uh, promoted to general. But this is a line here that the uh, guys from uh, Maine would have to take. And we're about 400 uh, of these men and uh, they're going into position here, hearing the roar and the thunder of fighting that we've talked about earlier. The action over there with the 16th Michigan, that all happened earlier. These guys are well aware of what's happening over here, but it seems to be that there's uh, uh, no immediate threat to their front. 
Here I want to change sides though and also look at a perspective that you don't see much in the movie Gettysburg and that is the other guy who's going to be commanding in this sector of the battlefield and that's William Oates. He's from Alabama. Uh, Colonel Oates, as a young man, was a sort of ne'er-do-well. Indeed, uh, uh, as a, what we would call a teenager today, got into trouble with the sheriff and left town for some reason. Went out to Texas where he could gain his fortune or fame. Somehow got involved in a duel. We're not sure of the details, but this, he had a come to Jesus moment. Went back, repented, and came back to Alabama and uh, tried to make things right with uh, the folks he had left back there. Considered becoming a clergyman, but uh, ended up being a lawyer. Some difference there, but still trying to be a leader in his, some leader in his community. And then when the war broke out, he was very effective in recruiting troops and was soon becoming the colonel of the 15th Alabama. His men had marched 25 miles to get to the battlefield on this day, July 2nd. They had gotten into the position on the dark woods across from the green grass that we talked about earlier in the Beesucker Woods, and his men were pleading, pleading, pleading for water. They were so thirsty from that march. He uh, allowed men from each company to gather all the canteens and go off to a well to stream to find water and then to return. But while they were gone, the order came that the attack was to begin. Those guys with the canteens basically never heard of from again. Anyway, he does say, I can't tell a general that we're going to hold off till we get our water. You are told to attack, you will attack. And as the attack came in, again, I talked about the, the boulders and the streams and the, and the disrupted ground. There was actually a crisscrossing which occurred that put him on the right flank. Uh, two brigades, two regiments of the brigade switched to the other side and the 15th and 47th Alabama ended up fighting on the right. He will be uh, uh, annoyed by Berdan sharpshooters, a Union force that was uh, trying to slow him down, but they will draw him toward, toward Round Top and also the high ground of the battlefield. Uh, he will get his men there. I have one time in my life made the trek that he, his men took, and I'm not going to do it again. It was too exhausting. But I can't imagine having, having 25 miles and then trying to get there and then climb up that hill. We, for your convenience, have a parking lot halfway up and then a nice walkway that you can get up, but still it's cardiac exercise to get up there. He gets up to the top and then realizes he's got the high ground on the battlefield. And the high ground is what you're always seeking on a battlefield for the tactical advantage it brings. He also spies that to the Tiny Town Road, a wagon park, which may be ammunition, sends one of his companies, about 10% of his men, down there to try to seize that wagon park, which would diminish his, his support. In the meantime, the fighting is happening down here, and word gets up there, uh, uh, first of all from General Law and then Robertson, that you've got to join, you've got to join in the attack. He tries to dispute with the aide by saying, wait a minute, uh, I've got the high ground, you want me to leave the high ground? And they said, you've got to, because this attack was not working without him. And so he will take the two uh, regiments, the 15th Alabama, he's in effective operational control of the uh, 47th Alabama as well. They will have to leave the top of Round Top and come down, and by the way, it's very difficult coming down and very dangerous, slick coming down. I don't know how they came down in formation at all. Some places are cliffs. But anyway, they're dutifully coming down, and we're getting well into the evening of July 2nd when their attack will come through what we call the saddle between Round Top and Little Round Top. They're the men who are going to be facing Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. So guys from Alabama, about 800, well now about uh, 800, 700 strong. Guys from uh, Maine here, about 400 strong. But of course the guys from Maine have put up these breastworks and they're in a defensive position so they have an advantage of position even though they're outnumbered in numbers. This attack will flare through here and, and William Oates will have directions of attack coming right behind me to my right shoulder, come up here, and it is touch and go. It is touch and go. In fact, Chamberlain himself will say, Squads of the enemy broke through our lines in several places and the fight was literally hand to hand. The edge of conflict swayed to and fro in the wild whirlpools and eddies. And at times I saw around me more of the enemy than my own men with gaps opening and swallowing and closing up with sharp convulsive energy. Again, it was very chaotic here, but the Yankees were able to hold them back, those Alabamians. Well, of course, what's going to happen is that uh, William Oates is going to have to develop a different strategy, tactics. He can't attack directly this way. He's tried and, and, and uns not successful. So he will begin to move his men more around, stretch them more around to the right. Chamberlain had also uh, detached one of his companies, uh, Company B, Captain Worrell, down there to his flank and they will sort of disappear for a while 
uh, down there uh, toward the Tiny Town Road. When uh, it becomes apparent to Colonel Chamberlain, the attack is going to be coming in more from that direction. He cannot just shift his whole regiment because he can't create a gap which would be exploited. He must stretch them. Indeed, he stretched them in what we call refusing them, which is bending it back around. Left flank here, point there, and then bending around over well behind you, there's a, right, uh, a left flank marker for the, for the 20th Maine. It's almost like a bobby pin <laughs> as it bends back so much. But he's got to protect here, but he's also got to defend there. And indeed, there will be attacks coming in there from William Oates. Uh, William Oates uh, will swing around to the right, and he will seek to gain the enemy's rear and drive them from the hill. And then there's a dispute which I cannot settle because in the chaos of the action, you can see we have a licensed guide over there with some folks and a boulder. That's the Oates boulder over there, so-called because William Oates said his brother died there and he wanted to honor where his brother died in the attack. Well, if rebels got to that point there, they were actually coming in around uh, into the back of the 20th Maine. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain said that that didn't happen. Oates said it did. I don't know whether it did or not, but I'll tell you, it was chaotic touch and go here as well. And then as the rebels fall back, they're planning one more attack. There will be the fixing of bayonets. <clears throat> fixing of bayonets is a very frightful thing. Of course, you're turning your musket into a pike. It takes 20, 30, 40 seconds uh, to, to load a musket. And so you often don't have that much time, so you have to use your, your rifle as, as, a, as a pike and try to do, use it. And so uh, William Oates will uh, be planning another attack coming around over there. Chamberlain, according to the movie, uh, kneels down into the, the dirt, and there's not much dirt here, a lot of rocks, so I'm not sure where, where that happened, but he tries to draw out the, the design of a swinging door. Uh, a major, Cheryl, said it didn't happen quite like that, and I wasn't here to, to, saw, to resolve that, but clearly what Chamberlain has done is to order his men to, to fix bayonets and to be prepared to attack, a counterattack by bayonet. And how it would work would be almost like a swinging door. If that were the hinge down there, and the left wing would swing around, and then the light right wing would join with it. What we discover is that that's how it happened. Whoever directed it, could have been Chamberlain, could have been Cheryl, could have been men on their own, whatever. The rebels realize, after all they've done, that now they're facing an attack in their front. And Oates will actually respond with one of the more, I think, honest comments that is made. Uh, often when the people recount what happened here and how they saved the battle and what, how their men did so magnanimously, uh, Oates said at that point, we ran like a herd of wild cattle. <laughs> Very honest. He actually stumbled and fell himself and two brawny guys from Alabama picked him up on each shoulder and carried him uh, over to Round Top to safety. But now dusk has come, darkness is approaching, and the action here is finished. And Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is held, even as the others have held along here. And so it would be day two will go on. There'll be more fighting up Cemetery Ridge, uh, where there will actually be a breach of the Union line, Barksdale, Wilcox, Lang, Wright. There'll be attacks by Johnson's division at Culp's Hill that night. There'll be attacks by uh, Hayes, Hayes and Avery's uh, uh, brigades. It is an unbelievable day, what's happened here. But I conclude here by saying you can read all the books and believe me, there are a lot of books. I thought one time, 20 years ago, I just read every book on Gettysburg, and now they're producing them faster than I can read them. <laughs> you can read every book on Gettysburg, and I will tell you, you do not understand it, though, until you've walked the ground, mm -hmm. until you've seen the actual ground where it happened, and then you can begin to realize what they were talking about. But also the chaos of the moment and the carnage of the moment, the casualties that were being sla uh, slayed across this ground and blood everywhere, unbelievable. Remember I said at the beginning, what is the cost, what is the value of this ground here? Well, I'll tell you, the cost is in human blood. It's in American blood that was paid for this. And this has become truly a point of pilgrimage. And you're, if you think about it, what you are is you're on a pilgrimage to a place which is very sacred in American history, the battlefield of Gettysburg, and particularly now to, to Little Round Top. I want to thank you for coming here today. If you didn't come, I wouldn't have a job. But also, I hope that you're enriched by your experience of being with me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll take on any questions that you have. I do have maps and I have the schedule of activities. It's an opinion question, but mm -hmm. do you believe without that bayonet charge that they would have taken this hill, Alabama, and Texas? And then I, I, it's doubtful. It's out. doubtful because of the exhaustion level of those guys they from Alabama. Have taken. It was the and again, and again, and, and you, you do have a Stephen Weed's brigade that's up there. 
uh, they were online, but they could have been used. To, to, so I think it's, it's doubtful. Uh, anytime we get into counterfactual history, which is what we're talking about, what if this had happened, we soon get into fantasy land because we don't know how the other side would have responded to that change in operations, and, and I, we don't know. It certainly could have uh, caused a rout of the entire Union Army, but it may have been just another yeah. segment of the battle. And again, they, as uh, correct me actually if I'm wrong, but they marched, what, 35 miles, a quiet ways to get here, yes. and now you don't have water. Yes. Now, I've been in, co in combat in the mid-60s. Yeah. Let me tell you. Uh, uh, your ex your you exhaustion level is stressful. Yes. And water. You'll get water. everything for water. Ex ex I appreciate anything. your comment because I read that in the soldiers' letters too, the yes. water. They, they are wanting to put their lives at stake. I re read soldiers who go out into the no man's land between looking for canteens of enemy soldiers or mm -hmm. something like that or getting, trying to get to a spring because of the water. Understand they've perspired so much, but often bleeding, and of course, yeah. the dehydration is enormous. You'll give anything for it. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank and you for your I comment. Can I ask one question? You're right about, I've read a, qu a number of years, 48 years, and I've learned so much from you today. And here's my question. I'm here today. But the hinge is down there. Mm -hmm. and, let me get here. The hinge is down here mm -hmm. and the chamber. They're right, going. right. Okay, okay. Oh, it swung around. That's yeah. correct. Okay. Swung around. If, if that were effectively the yeah. hinge, the left wing and then the right will join it as they drive the, the uh, rebels back to, to Round Top. Yeah. So they'll leave this open then for a period of time until they reform later? I mean, if you're moving this line, you've got a gap here it's just if you're coming up this way. Well, you, they will fall back to this position. Later in night, they will actually be ordered to, the, the 20th Maine will be ordered at the top of Big Round Top. This is a momentary thing, the surge that goes forward, and then they'll fall back to reestablish this line. Uh, and then later on, as more reinforcements are coming up uh, Fifth Corps, they will be ordered to, to the top of Big Round Top. Again. You said, this is they, did they have trees like this here at that time? At this, this, is time? Clo this is close to the uh, appearance. Uh, it's not exact, certainly, but uh, it, it would be more open like this where you have a coverage of, of trees over you, but you can see 50, 100 yards. No underbrush? No underbrush. Yeah. You know, Chamberlain, uh, here, Chamberlain and Oates had uh, quite a little bit in Tomlin. As you know, they were highly intelligent. Both were mayors Northward. in Maine, yes. et cetera, et cetera. Yes. But both highly intelligent. Yes. Uh, uh, it did quite well after the war. It did take Chamberlain 30 some odd years to get his uh, Medal of Honor, but he did finally get it. My understanding <laughs> it was in the early 1890s. It was. M many of them were done later. The whole idea of the Medal of Honor has uh, morphed through the years. Yes. And initially was given, it actually initially was not to be given to, to officers, and later on oh, officers really? got it too. Yeah, with the idea of the officers would get brevet promotions to honor their service. I didn't know that. Whereas the Medal of Honor was yeah. to, but that, that morphed, and yeah. of course, uh, uh, there was a big push in the, in the 1890s. That's when yeah. Sickles gets his too, yeah. as well as Chamberlain. And then for the Confederacy, my understanding is there was no medal, but they did get sort of a, a piece of paper or something like they that. They did, and apparently flag. there was a medal which had been proposed. I don't know if it was actually being awarded, but they, they were trying to do the same thing, honor heroism. Yeah. And then naturally the standard, not saying they didn't deserve it, but today there's quite a process to get that. Oh, absolutely. And, and then, absolutely. you know, yes. it was not that they didn't deserve it. Yeah. But well, there were occasions that the whole units got, got the Medal yeah. of Honor for re-enlisting or something. Yeah. And if you f picked up a flag off the ground, yeah, you yes. could get it. So, yeah. again, the, 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 uh, the, it was not consistent through the years as to how or why the Medal yeah. of Honor was awarded. Yeah. Anyway, I like to say, he's photographing maybe me and you, uh, uh, excellent knowledge, and you did a great job. And uh, as an American citizen, I well, appreciate... Well, thank you for your service, too. I, as I a, appreciate as people like you. <laughs> thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. And I have my dog tag right here. Good. Uh, <laughs> I hide them because, you know, but I, 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 I wear those here because of the men that were here. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Thank you, You sir. honor them, Thanks. sir. Anybody else have questions?